Okay, so hello everybody and uh, welcome to the University of Washington's Astrobiology Seminar Series. Today our distinguished speaker will be uh, Professor James Casting of Penn State University. I'm going to give a little intro on, uh, on Jim here. Jim got his A.B. at Harvard University in 1975 in chemistry and physics. Uh, he did a uh, master's in both physics and atmospheric chemistry in 1978 and then got his Ph.D. from the University of Michigan in 1979 in atmospheric science. Uh, he is a very distinguished uh, scientist. He has been recently elected as a fellow of the American Geophysical Union in 2004 and this year he was elected as a fellow of the Geochemical Society and of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences as well. Uh, Jim has not only uh, worked as an academic and a researcher, but he's very active uh, in uh, helping NASA design some of its planetary missions, and in particular Terrestrial Planet Finder, and he has served on the NASA Terrestrial Planet Finder Science Working Group, the TPFC Design and Technology Definition Team, which I worked with him on, and also the NASA NSF Exoplanet Task Force, which sounds like it should come with a special uniform. Uh, he is. It does. Okay. <laughs> He's currently the distinguished professor of geosciences and meteorology at Penn State University, and in his spare time, he works on the editorial board for Astrobiology Journal, and as a member of the Astrophysics Subcommittee for the NASA Advisory Committee, where he represents the interests of astrobiology uh, for these large uh, astrophysical missions that we hope to fly. He uh, works principally on the geophysical history of the Earth, focusing on climate and the evolution of planetary atmospheres. And today he's going to talk to us about, was the early Earth hot? Okay, thank you, Vicki, and thank you all for inviting me out here. I have been to University of Washington a couple of times before, I think, but not for quite a while. I'm trying to remember the last time I was here, I think it was maybe 10 years ago, uh, Conway Leovi, who many of you may know, invited me out. I had known Conway for a long time because he used to come down to NASA Ames where I worked before I went to Penn State. He would come down and work with Jim Pollock and Bob Haverly there on, on modeling Mars climate. So actually my contacts with University of Washington go back a, a long ways. Uh, I, the weather here is not the greatest today, but let me tell you that in State College when I left yesterday it was 35 degrees and raining, so it's actually <laughs> it's a pleasure to be out here on the <laughs> relatively warm west coast. What I want to talk today is about the, uh, the climate on the early earth. Some of you may have heard my, my student, or now postdoc, uh, Sean Goldman was here a month ago and he talked about sulfur photochemistry on the early earth and the sulfur mass independent fractionation problem. I'm not going to do that because I didn't want to give the same talk. That's probably what I would have talked about if Sean hadn't. But this is a topic that I'm also uh, very interested in. And uh, there's people here that uh, I've been already chatted with. Roger Buick. Is Roger out there? There's Roger up there uh, in particular. So I, uh, it's a very controversial issue. And I, I should say also that uh, today I'm giving the talk here. Two days from now, I'm going to go down to Stanford, where Don Lowe and Norm Sleep have been arguing about the climate of the early Earth for the past five years or so, maybe more than that. So anyway, I, I thought this would be a good topic for both audiences. Just to introduce you here, the, the uh, climate of the early Earth obviously has varied with time. Sometimes it's been warmer, sometimes it's been colder. In general, though, we think that the early Earth uh, prior to now is usually warmer than it is today. Here's a slide that shows the temperatures and other events during the Phanerozoic, the last 540 million years of Earth history. Uh, we're in an ice age right now by, by my definition of an ice age. You know, normally we think we're not in an ice age that was 10, 20,000 years ago. We're in interglacial between ice ages. But from a long-term perspective, there's ice on the, on the poles. And so we're in an ice age. There has been ice on Antarctica since about 35 million years ago. So we've been in an ice age for the last uh, 35 million years. You can call it the Pleistocene ice age or the late Cenozoic ice age, uh, if you like. Prior to that, the Mesozoic era was warm for a long time. This was the era when the dinosaurs were running around. You probably know there were uh, dinosaurs up in Alaska, north of the Arctic Circle. There were alligators, there were crocodiles in Siberia. So we think the Earth was considerably warmer than today. At that time, 
Prior to that, there was this long, about 80 million year long Permo-Carboniferous Ice Age, which was another sort of conventional ice age like the one that we're in right now, where you get ice sheets at the poles that occasionally expand. Prior to that, the, uh, most of the early Paleozoic was warm. Uh, this whole period here seems to be warm, except there was an ice age, pretty good, pretty good one, at the, uh, in the late Ordovician, where the continents became deeply glaciated. But that's a weird one. It lasted uh, less than a million years. It defines a single stage in the geologic record, and it's in a period uh, that is otherwise warm. So that, that one's a curious one. These two, the one that we're in right now and the permocarboniferous, I would argue, are probably caused by changes in atmospheric CO2. You know, the sun is slowly brightening. That's not a huge factor in the Phanerozoic, but CO2 goes up and down because it's controlled mostly by the carbonate silicate cycle. And Bob Berner at Yale has run models for many years that uh, sort of explain the CO2 variations based on motions of the continents and when you get lots of weathering and uh, changes in seafloor spreading rates. If we go and look at the more uh, vast expanse of Earth history, go back through geologic time, the Phanerozoic is now compressed up here at the top. And the rest of this time, back to four and a half billion years, used to just be called the Precambrian. But of course, we divide it, subdivide it now into the Hadean and the Archean and the Proterozoic eons. Uh, at the end of the Proterozoic, just before the Cambrian explosion, there were some very deep glaciations, at least two of them, which many of you have probably heard about. These are the ones that Joe Kirschwink and Paul Hoffman have popularized as being snowball earth episodes. I think they're right. I think the earth probably was frozen over entirely at that point, although maybe the ice was thin in the tropics, so there's, you've got to explain how the biota get through that. I'm not going to talk about that today. Prior to that, the, most of the middle Proterozoic was warm. The Earth was evidently ice-free for uh, almost a billion and a half years, and that's probably real because the geologic record is relatively good during the Proterozoic, at least compared to the Archean. I am going to talk about these two ice ages. There's a very well-documented ice age at 2.4 billion years or thereabouts, which happens to correspond with the rise of atmospheric oxygen. And that's a major theme of my talk today. I don't think that that's an accident. And so either one of the, either the rise of oxygen caused the ice age or vice versa. The ice age caused the rise of oxygen. Um, the Archean in general, now the geologic record gets pretty spotty as you go back uh, earlier, but uh, we think it was probably warm. However, there's uh, evidence for an ice age here at 2.8, maybe to between 2.8 and 3 billion years, and there may be ice uh, even prior to that, although it's not, uh, nothing has been published. So that's important because the rest of this talk is, uh, well, the next part of it is all these people who've been saying that the early Earth was hot. So they, in the last four or five years, and in fact going back Prior to that, uh, actually for the last 20 or 30 years, there have been various people like Paul Knauf at uh, Arizona State who have argued that the, er the early Earth, both in the Archean and the Proterozoic, was, was actually quite hot, maybe 70 degrees, uh, 60 to 70 degrees during the Archean. In fact, Paul actually likes 85 degrees for the Archean, uh, if you press him on it. Why? Do uh, people argue that the early Earth was hot? Well, a lot of it comes from isotope records. And I'm going to just briefly go through uh, some of the isotopic data. If you look at the most recent ice age that we're in, the Pleistocene, you know, the glaciers have been coming and going. We know most of what we know about that comes from oxygen isotopes and carbonates. And, uh, if you have uh, more O18 in the carbonates, that means that the climate is colder. Here's a del delta O18 is a measure uh, relative to standard mean ocean water. That's the relative amount of O18 in carbonates. As that gets higher, then the climate is cold. And as that gets lower, the climate is warm. Today, that happens because of two main things. One is the buildup of ice on the poles, which is low in do uh, O18. And the other is that there's a fractionation between seawater and carbonates. And the colder the water gets, then the more enriched the carbonates get in O18. Well, that, 
that's not controversial, or at least not very controversial on the, the recent glacial interglacial time scale. But if you try to go back even through the Phanerozoic, then it becomes controversial because there's a big trend in oxygen isotope data as Jan Weiser and Graham Shields and their collaborators have been arguing for many years. This is Weiser's, uh, Shields and Weiser's uh, oxygen isotope database from carbonates, basically all their data going back from the present to three and a half billion years ago. The dots are different data points and then this line is uh, drawn through the middle. You can see that there's a very steep fall off. You're going down towards lighter uh, isotopically depleted carbonates. Uh, much of the drop off happens during the Phanerozoic here and then it sort of levels out. But by the time you get that back to the uh, Archean back in here, the carbonates are at least 10, maybe 15 per mil lighter than they are today. And that, taken at face value, that means high temperatures. Here's a calibration scale for how this works. This is uh, the delta O18 of calcite versus uh, relative to the uh, PD belemnite, and this is temperature. These are for different amounts, uh, different concentrations of uh, oxygen 18 in seawater. I'm going to talk, one of the variables here is whether seawater has remained constant, but if you just stay up here at the top where seawater is at zero per mil on the, on the SMO scale, standard mean ocean water, then it's sort of a linear, almost a linear relationship and what have I written? Ten, a, a change in 10 per mil in delta O18 corresponds to a temperature increase of some 54 degrees Celsius. That's a lot. So if the Archean really was 10 per mil lower in delta O18, if that was all temperature, today the mean temperature is about 15 Celsius, so that would put you at about 70 C for the Archean. All right, now there's lots of criticisms to that. Uh, what's the, the main one, the one that's been argued for a long time, is that uh, you may be affected by diagenesis. When sediments, carbonates in particular, when they're, they're deposited at the seafloor, they can continue to exchange oxygen with seawater. And as they get more deeply buried and warmed up, but just by the geothermal gradient, then the, the, as long as the seawater is still in contact with the carbonates, you can get uh, exchange of isotopes. And that tends to make the carbonates, remember they're enriched in O18 to begin with, so that tends to deplete them and makes them isotopically lighter. So this is what I always used to think, that that whole oxygen isotope trend was just, just diagenetic and therefore we could afford to ignore all those data, which was very convenient because they're hard to explain if you don't ignore them. Um, however, there's lots of people that have argued the opposite. Paul Knauf, Jan Beiser, Linda K, K, Mike Arthur, who's in our department at Penn State. Lots of the you know, carbonate, the isotope G chemists have always argued that that's not the case. Now there's also evidence from silicon isotopes, this paper by Robert and Chosidon from a couple years ago that seems to co corroborate the oxygen isotope data. And uh, I will talk about that in a moment. There is another explanation for the uh, tre trend in the carbonates that is even more controversial, and that's that the isotopic composition of seawater has changed with time. Now, uh, this is something that I've, uh, the last part of my talk will be concerned about this because I've, now that I've gotten reinterested in the in the data, I've ventured into this fray myself. But there's a, a run, been a running debate for 30 or 40 years, ever since oxygen isotopes were uh, were first measured, as to whether the ocean stays constant. And there's there are actually a lot of geochemists who would argue that that's the case. I'm going to argue in this talk that it, that it's not the case that the seawater changes with time. However, there is a, uh, and obviously if the ocean was isotopically lighter back in the past, then you know, that 10 per mil change in the carbonates could just be due to a change of 10 per mil in seawater and have nothing to do with surface temperature. However, there's a way of checking this, and uh, that uh, comes from this very new technique, which is uh, from John Eiler's group down at Caltech. He calls it the clumped isotope technique. There's a paper by Rosemary Kame et al. in Nature last year. And what this is, this is something I just learned about this from hearing John Eiler talk at the Goldschmidt Conference in Melbourne a couple of years ago. He's looking at carbonates again here 
but he's measuring uh, me measuring carbonates that have that are multiply substituted with rare isotopes. So, for instance, here suppose you've got on this side here the normal carbonate has a carbon 12 and uh, three O16s in it, right? But this carbonate here has both a carbon 13 and an oxygen 18, along with two of the normal O16s. This is a very rare isotope, very difficult to measure because, you know, that what the one percent of carbon is is uh, C13, I think, and about one or two percent of oxygen is O18. So this is it's very tricky to measure the concentration of this. But here he's written out. Uh, uh, an equilibrium reaction, this is 13 CO3 double minus plus this carbonate ion here has uh, an O18 in it and then they're reacting to form this one. This is what uh, Eiler calls a clumped isotope. He's got the, both of the heavy isotopes in the same species here. And the nice thing about this, if you can measure the abundances of all, all four of these species, that, that equilibrium depends on temperature. Cold temperatures favor the heavy, the clumped isotope here, and it's independent of the uh, concentration of O18 in seawater. Right? So that's the real nice thing about it. That gets you away from this question of whether seawater varies with time. So the uh, Kame et al. paper came out. By the way, Jan Weiser was a co-author on this. Jan is one of the people who's argued vociferously that seawater composition does change with time. But Eiler got him in, and you know, Jan has at least given in partly on this. They've used this technique then to look at, uh, at ancient carbonates in a couple periods from the Phanerozoic. One is the uh, Carboniferous which is uh, during that permocarboniferous ice age when it's cold. And another, th that's this sample right here, and there's another sample from the early Silurian when it's warm. So that's these data here. This is ocean temperature inferred from the clumped isotope technique. The, the diamonds are their data here, cold in the carboniferous, warm in the early Silurian. This solid curve is Bob Berner's theoretical curve where he's running his carbon cycle model and trying to fit the climate. And then this is, uh, I think this is Weiser, Wallman's, Jan Weiser and Klaus Wallman's oxygen isotope curve where they're trying to let sea level, uh, sea, seawater isotopic composition vary. Um, over here, what they, once you've, once you, if you think you know the temperature, you can then infer what seawater oxygen isotope composition is. And here we are today at zero. There, the clumped isotope technique says that seawater hasn't changed by more than two per mil back to this, uh, back as, as early as the, uh, uh, the early Silurian. These, this curve right here, this solid curve, is how Jan Weiser thinks the uh, seawater composition has varied. And this lighter curve, I think, is Klaus Wallmann's curve. Both of these, they, they, both models, they assume that it varies. So the point is, is the, uh, of the Kame et al. paper is that seawater hasn't changed by nearly enough to explain the uh, oxygen isotope data, meaning that it really was warm back in the early Silurian. And back to where we were, th th that one of the, the cold data point was during this ice age, so that, that uh, makes sense. The warm data point is from the, it's between 443 and 423 million years ago. So it's right here, it's right after this late Ordovician Ice Age. But that, as I said, that Ice Age is an anomaly. It's a very quick uh, Ice Age that happened in the midst of an otherwise warm period. And uh, the clumped isotope data indicate that the temperatures here were something like 5 to 11 degrees Celsius warmer than today. So it, it, at any rate, that, uh, that round has gone to those that think that seawater composition stays constant or more or less. Back to the oxygen isotope data, the other thing that you can look at is cherts, which are SiO2. Uh, cherts tend to be better preserved over longer time periods than carbonates are, and so this is what Paul Knauth has used for a long time. He's measured oxygen isotopes in cherts and used this to infer uh, things about Precambrian climates. These are Paul Knauth's data from a uh, 2005 review paper that he wrote this is del 018 of the cherts, 
And uh, you can see that as you, this is time going back to three and a half billion years ago. Uh, what Paul likes to do is he looks at, there's a big spread in the data which come from all sorts of processes. He likes to look at the upper envelope of the spread, which Paul would argue are the least altered, least uh, uh, affected, or the, the most representative of the uh, ocean conditions. And you can see that these also become lighter in 018 as you go back. Then there's a big drop off right around the Archean Proterozoic boundary. And then the Archean back here, all the charts are really light. And this is what Paul, uh, where he, these data have been around, most of them for a long time. This is where he gets his 70 degree Archean temperatures. So that's the published uh, figure. There was, there was a paper in GSA Bulletin by Paul Knauf and Don Lowe. In 2003, they published 70 degrees plus or minus 15 at about 3.3 billion years ago. Um, the carbonate data, you know, the carbonate data are not exactly the same because the biggest change in the carbonates actually occurs during the Phanerozoic, whereas the bigger change in the cherts occurs back uh, between the Archean and the Proterozoic. But the carbonate data say that uh, ocean temperatures remain warm until fairly recently, you know, only 400 million years ago. So in fact, this hypothesis predicts that the Earth was warm all the way up until fairly recent history. Uh, 70 degrees in the Archean, but still 55 degrees or so at the beginning of the Cambrian, if you take it at face value. Now, uh, neither of those techniques uh, neither of the carbonate techniques rules out diagenesis, but, uh, and you can also get, uh, you, well, you can have various factors that affect the, the, the charts, but what has uh, happened recently is that uh, this uh, paper that I mentioned at the outset by Robert and Chosidon, they have looked at the silicon isotope composition of charts. Normal silicon, it's mostly silicon 28, but there's a certain amount of silicon 30 in there, and uh, you can measure, chert is SiO2, so you can measure both its oxygen and silicon isotopic composition. Uh, here's a plot of delta 30 Si in parts per mil versus age. And it's kind of complicated because the, the points in the Phanerozoic, uh, they would, uh, these authors would argue, just ignore them. And the reason is because at the beginning of the Phanerozoic, uh, silica precipitating organisms evolved, and that became a biological influence on the silicon cycle. Uh, but prior to the beginning of the Phanerozoic, there were no such organisms, so you had a lot more amorphous silica that built up in seawater. And then there's a trend. I've, this is my red line going through here, but there's a trend that silicon isotopes become lighter, delta. 30 SI is lighter as you go back in time. And what they've then done on the right-hand plot is they've plotted delta 30 SI versus delta 018 from the same data, from the, from the same charts. And you can see that there's a big scatter plot, but you can draw a line through that. The silicon isotopes correlate with the oxygen isotopes reasonably well. And then the, these authors say that rules out diagenesis as a uh, as a cause for the, the variation in the silicon isotopes. Think about cherts or sil silica deposits. They also can, ex if they have water flowing through them when they're down in the sediments, they can exchange oxygen isotopes with the water, but there's not enough silicon in the water to exchange silicon isotopes. And so these are, authors argue that the silica does, silicon doesn't get reset and therefore, the fact that it correlates with the oxygen means that not all of the oxygen data are getting reset either. I think that's a, a reasonable argument. But the, I mean, this is one of the first papers that I've seen on silicon isotopes. The fractionation in silicon isotopes, by the way, depend. Silica is coming out of the mid-ocean ridge hydrothermal vents. It's either removed by precipitation on the basalts as it flows through the hydro hydrothermal vents or it's removed bio biologically uh, or just from precipitation in, uh, of amorphous, amorphous silica in seawater. And according to Robert and Chosidon, the fractionation occurs uh, when it comes out by interacting with the basalts. So the fractionation that you get depends on the temperature difference between the hydrothermal vents and seawater in their model. I'm going to go through this kind of quickly because I've got a lot of things to say. Uh, but that's 
that's the argument here. And then what they've done is they uh, they've plotted the silicon, the temperatures from the silicon isotopes. This is now age again, going back to three and a half billion years ago. The solid curve, it's the temperatures inferred from the oxygen isotopes in Chertz. This gray area here is the temperatures that they infer from the silicon isotopes in Chertz. They more or less agree, although there's a lot of sca scatter in the silicon data, but then they say that this supports the idea that the early Earth was hot and, and may rule out diagenesis as being the cause of that variation. Okay, so that's all geochemists and isotope stuff. The biologists have been getting into this too, and uh, there's several recent papers saying that the biological record says the same thing. This is not a new idea either. Uh, here's a ribosomal RNA tree. How many people here have seen such a tree? Uh, so this is Washington, so you all, all, most of you have seen this. This comes from looking, doing sequencing of uh, ribosomal RNA or the DNA analog thereof, and you get the three domains of life, the archaea, the bacteria, and the eukarya. Uh, this is a way, one way of looking deep into evolutionary history and what has been the root of the tree, it's shown here as an unrooted tree, but various arguments would place, most biologists I think would place the root of the tree somewhere down near the base of the bacteria. Most, of the, uh, most or all of the organisms near that root are hyperthermophiles, that is organisms that live at uh, preferred growth temperatures above 80 Celsius. And that's been very controversial in the biological literature for a long time, exactly what that means. Four years ago, there was another paper that came out by Eric uh, Gaucher. I, don't, I haven't met Eric, but uh, he was a member of Steve Benner's group at uh, University of Florida. And they looked at what they call resurrected proteins. So they're now looking at different genes and uh, in this paper, what they did is they, they're looking at a particular uh, gene, set of genes that codes for this elongation factor protein, EFTU, which I'm, I'm not a very good biologist, so I don't even know what the TU stands for, but this is the most common protein in, uh, in E. coli, which is you know, the standard laboratory bacterium. And it's th these elongation factor proteins are, are present in, in all organisms in large abundances, so you can do comparisons with these. What they've done then is they, they do molecular phylogeny on this gene, try to decide which protein sequences or the sequences, uh, which genes are common to the uh, last common ancestor of these different uh, existing bac uh, bacteria, and then they look at that protein, and in this paper they just tried to estimate what the temperature stability of that protein was. Here in this upper graph, they've looked at uh, organisms that span the range from mesophiles that live at 0 to 40 degrees, thermophiles that live from 40 to 80, and hyperthermophiles, so basically all organisms. Uh, and they found that uh, if you do that, the, the two dark curves, the yellow or the blue and the green, are their estimated uh, temperatures. This is the melting temperature of the protein uh, for these ancient organisms. And this red curve, that's thermos, that's a, that's a, a thermophilic uh, existing bacteria. So that if you look at all organisms with this technique, you find out that they look like they have a thermophilic uh, common ancestor in the bottom. Uh, panel here. They've, they've excluded present-day thermophilic organisms. They have just look at mesophiles, organisms that live below 40 degrees, and they've done the same type of analysis, and they find that even modern-day mesophiles appear to have a thermophilic ancestor. So, for instance, E. coli here is a mesophile, which uh, uh, has a protein that's elongation factor uh, tends to melt at, a, at about 40 degrees or less, or I guess that's the preferred growth temperature. I'll probably uh, garble this part because I'm not a very good biologist, but that's the preferred growth temperature for E. coli, whereas the ancestor of E. coli and other mesophiles had a, a preferred growth temperature around 55 Celsius. So that's sort of consistent. Well, it's a slightly different from what we just looked at on the last slide because the argument of this paper was the last common ancestor was a thermophile, but not a hyperthermophile. 
All right, I had missed that paper when it came out, but then I didn't miss this one. This is one that came out, same group, or at least Gaucher is still the first author. This is just a, from in Nature in February of this year. They're now looking at resurrected proteins, and they're doing this uh, more elaborately. They actually uh, figure out the, pro the gene sequence for these ancient proteins. They synthesize that gene and then they inject it into a E. coli, and the E. coli produces the protein, then they take that protein and measure its melting temperature in the lab. And then they've uh, done this for various organisms, and they use molecular clocks. They take published molecular clock estimates, one of them by my colleague Blair Hedges at Penn State, where he's tried to place d dates on the evolutionary time scale. And they've, they've got temperatures for organisms of different ages, and here they've, they've done these, uh, these dots with error bars are their biological estimate, temperature estimates from resurrected proteins. And they've plotted that, the, the light curve, these two light curves are different estimates of the temperature from the oxygen isotope data. And so sure enough, they, their resurrected proteins fall on the same thing. So the uh, thesis of this paper then, I'll just quote it, they say, our results are further supported by nearly identical cooling trend for the ancient ocean as inferred from the deposition of oxygen isotopes. The convergence of results from natural and physical sciences suggests that ancient life has continually adapted to changes in environmental temperatures throughout its evolutionary history. In other words, the whole biological evolutionary history of the Earth is being driven by these constantly decreasing temperatures throughout geologic time. And if it, uh, my good colleague David Schwartzman has written a book on this. He actually wrote his book, I think, 15 years ago, making the same argument that biological evolution is driven by a cooling temperature on the Earth. So I, I, I don't agree with that, and, and I want to give you my reasons. But what prompts the talk is that there's now this string of recent papers in the literature claiming that all the evidence point in that direction. So let's think about it. And the way I think about it, I'm a theoretician, so let's think about it first from a theoretical standpoint. We're pretty sure that the sun was less bright back in the past. Uh, here's a published solar evolution curve, uh, an old one from Douglas Goff, published in 1981, but it hasn't really changed very much since then. The standard solar model is pretty much the same. If you go back to... Four, uh, this is time running from four and a half billion years up to the present, and this is solar luminosity relative to today. We're at one today. The early sun was about 30% less luminous. That's because it's converting hydrogen to helium in its core, and as it does so, the core becomes denser. It shrinks and heats up, and the fusion reactions go faster. Just to calibrate here, at 3.3 billion years ago, that's when now and Lowe think it was 70 degrees Celsius, the sun at that point was about 77% as bright as it is today. So you, you have to have a big greenhouse effect and, and really overcompensate for this uh, decrease in solar luminosity. Uh, what are the most likely gases for causing the greenhouse effect on the early Earth? I think Sean Goldman probably talked some about this, so I'm going to be rather brief about it. CO2 is one of them. The, the big greenhouse gases today are CO2 and water vapor. CO2 is largely controlled by the carbonate silicate cycle. Shown here, CO2 comes out of volcanoes. Uh, it's consumed by silicate weathering on the continents, and then there's carbonate precipitation in the oceans. The carbonates get dragged down, and they get heated up, uh, and they undergo metamorphism. So CO2 is cycling through here. If the early Earth was colder, then the weathering would slow down, so volcanic CO2 would build up. So there is a mechanism for forcing CO2 to build up if, when the sun was less bright. This is something that I've worked on for a long time. If volcanism was faster on the early Earth because the interior was hotter, then you'd expect more CO2 to come out of volcanoes. So you, you might, I mean, there's reasons to think that CO2 could have been quite high. But then you can do the types of things that, that we do. We build climate models. You can say, OK, well, uh, suppose the Archean Earth was 70 degrees at 3.3 billion years. How much CO2 would that take? Well, that's a, that's a doable problem. So we take our climate model, which we've carefully constructed and deconstructed over the past 20 years, and uh, we put in CO2. This is a one-dimensional climate model, what we call a radiative convective climate model. 
or you average out temperatures over the Earth, that's probably just fine when you're going to a dense CO2 atmosphere because the latitudinal gradients would be rather small. We run that model for 77% uh, solar luminosity, and these curves here, this is the CO2 partial pressure in bars on this axis. Today we're at 300 ppms, a little higher than that, or about 3 times 10 to the minus 4 bars down here. This is going up to 10 bars on the right. These curves are for different amounts of methane, and don't pay too much attention to those because we recently found a problem with the methane part, and so the, the methane greenhouse was overestimated in this model. Um, if you want to get to 70 degrees Celsius, that's about 340, a little over 340 Kelvin. Uh, according to these calculations, if you had 1,000 ppms of methane, you would need about three bars of CO2. And we, as I said, we actually overestimated the methane greenhouse effect, so probably need more than three bars of CO2 in order to get to be that warm. That by itself is not impossible. Uh, it depends how you think the, the carbonate silicate cycle ran on the early Earth. As I said, different people have different ideas about that. Norm, Norm Sleep and Kevin Zonley think all the Earth's CO2 was in the mantle at that time, and so it was really cold. Uh, recently, may, Sean Goldman may have showed this slide. We've re redone climate calculations. This is for a slightly later period in the late Archean, 2.8 billion years. Solar luminosity is 80% of present. We found that we've been overestimating the methane greenhouse effect just because the absorption coefficients were stuck in the wrong wavelength bin, so we fixed that. But then we also put in some additional things. There's, there's ethane in this model that we can predict from this formed photochemically from the methane and there are hydrocarbon particles and if you get the methane to CO2 ratio anywhere near one then you start even above a few tenths you start forming hydrocarbon particles and those give you anti greenhouse cooling and so when we put that all in and just try to make the bring the earth above freezing at the late in the late Archean we find that you need uh, well, here's a plausible late Archean Earth here. This has a few, uh, a few hundredths of a bar of CO2 and a temperature. Today's temperature is 288K on this scale. So uh, you, can, you can still warm the Earth with CO2 and methane, but you don't get as much warming out of the methane as we had uh, found earlier. The CO2 greenhouse effects have not changed. The reason I put this up here is that if you if you eliminate the methane, the temperatures will drop still by uh, 12 or 15 degrees C. So this is a good way of getting that uh, glaciation when oxygen goes up. All right, so to get to that point, almost all of us agree that oxygen went up at 2.4 billion years, except for my colleague Hiroshi Emoto, who still doesn't agree with that. And Sean, Sean talked about it. I'm just going to... Uh, I'm not going to dwell on it, but I'll show you a little bit of the evidence. Remember, this is this. There's an ice age here, right when oxygen goes up. The standard geologic evidence for the rise of oxygen. There's a lot of different things. Most suggested originally by Preston Cloud, way back in the late '60s and early '70s. Dick Holland, who's retired from Harvard now, worked on this problem for a long time. So this is one of his slides. Without going through it, the red boxes are evidence of high oxygen. The blue boxes are evidence for low oxygen. There's a big change in this figure somewhere around 2.2 billion years. The age dates have gotten a little better since then, so that might be, should be 2.4. Red beds, this is uh, oxidized iron in uh, soils and cliffs. Uh, it's mostly the, the mineral hematite. They come in around 2.2, so that's evidence for high oxygen. Uranium ores, it's all the same reduced uranium mineral, uraninite, but there's two different types. There's detrital uraninite and uh, uraninite that precipitated out of seawater. This detrital uraninite uh, was weathered out of the parent rock and carried down and deposited in its sediments without ever oxidizing. So that's considered to be evidence of low oxygen. And there's also detrital pyrite and siderite, which are other minerals. So th those have been two of the standard arguments for a change in oxygen at about 2.2. If you then look at the geologic record, one of the places where the, this uh, late, uh, early Proterozoic uh, glaciation, Paleoproterozoic 
glaciation it's called, uh, is well preserved. It's in the Huronian supergroup north, just north of Lake Huron. It's in southern Canada. It was mapped by a Canadian geologist named Stu Roscoe back in the late 60s. And uh, th this sequence goes, it's bounded in age by 2.2 billion years at the top and 2.4 or 5 billion years at the bottom. There's three glacial diamictites in here, the Galganda, the Bruce, and the Ramsey Lake. Below the bottommost one in this Matanenda formation, you find detrital uraninite and pyrite. And above the Galganda in the Lorraine formation, that's a red bed formation. So Roscoe pointed out way back 40 years ago or so that hmm, this, this to him was the first set of glaciations in Earth history. He said, isn't that interesting? That happened uh, right at the same time as oxygen went up because Preston Cloud had already published his theory of the rise of oxygen by that time. And Roscoe didn't have an explanation for that, but if you believe the methane greenhouse story, then it actually makes sense because when oxygen goes up, methane goes down, you lose 10 or 15 degrees of warming, so it's not surprising that Earth went into a glaciation. But there's other ways to explain that. And so that, the, the first way is that the rise of oxygen causes the glaciation. The second way, you can invert that and you can say the glaciation caused the rise of oxygen. That logically is also self-consistent. This has been published by uh, Lowe and Tice in Precambrian Research last year. So their argument is that cyanobacteria had evolved. Cyanobacteria are the organisms that produce the first oxygen. They have, most of them have a maximum growth temperature of 60 degrees. There's one species, which name I forget right now, that can live up to 72 or 73 degrees Celsius. Uh, they, they're studied in places like Yellowstone where you have these hot spring pools. And so in the low and Tice model, they say, well, the Archean was 60 or 70 degrees when the temperatures finally got down low enough for cyanobacteria to thrive, then they produced a lot of oxygen and that uh, caused the rise of oxygen, right? So here's a figure from their paper that does this. This is time running from three and a half to two billion years ago. The solid curve is CO2 in their model. And so in order, they have to have everything driven by CO2. It, methane also varies, but that's really not that important in their model. So here back in the Arche early Archean, CO2 was high. Notice that there's no real numbers on this scale, but we just looked at that. You need three bars of CO2 or more to make it hot back then. Then uh, the continents start to grow, and that's plausible. They, we know there was a lot of continental growth along here. That sucked down CO2 by uh, silicate weathering. CO, it, CO2 got low, the temperatures dropped. They agree that there's a glaciation around three billion years or so. Then, I, oh, this is where I always forget this part of the story. They ran out of continents to weather or something, and so uh, CO2 went back up in the late Archean, back up to 60 or 70 degrees. Then CO2 dropped again for some reason, and that causes the rise of oxygen at that point. So you can do this whole thing by having CO2 go up and down, but even though I read this paper recently, I can't remember uh, anything except for the first reason why it changes. Maybe somebody here remembers that. So anyway, the, the problem with that is you, you have to really, you, you need huge swings. And if you're gonna drive the whole climate by CO2, you need huge swings. To make it warm, you need three or more bars of CO2. To get down to glacial conditions, you gotta be well below one bar. You probably need to be down to a few tenths of a bar. So it's gotta be going up and down and it's doing it multiple times. And if you find any other evidence for glaciation in the Archean, then you would have to do it yet again. Uh, so that's, you know, that, I'm a theoretician. That's difficult for us theoreticians to explain. If you go, uh, if you had three, another thing that is testable from the geologic record is if you had three bars of CO2 and 70 degrees Celsius, rainwater would be both hot and very acidic because three bars of CO2 is 10,000 times the current concentration. The pH of rainwater drops about a log, uh, one unit for every factor of 100 increase in CO2. So this three bar atmosphere at 70 degrees C, the pH of rainwater, instead of being 5.7, it'd be 3.7. And that would really weather the heck out of anything that was exposed to it. 
And then if you look in the literature, there's arguments as to whether that weathering was uh, going on at that rate. Norm Sleep and Don Lowe have been publishing, published arguments uh, uh, about that uh, in the past few years. Okay, so I'm not going to take a side on that, although uh, I, I, I don't think that Dick Collins, if you read his 84 book, he also cites evidence in there. He doesn't think that weathering in the Archean was all that rapid compared to today. All right, well then, this brings me to the last part of the talk here. If you, I, I'm going to argue that the temperature was not hot, but then you have to, how do you explain the oxygen and the silicon isotope data, which are sitting around there, and if you can't explain them, then you've got a problem. So let's think about what controls the oxygen isotope composition of seawater. It was a very nice paper by Car Carlos Muhlenbox and uh, Bob Clayton back in uh, the mid-1970s. Clayton, of course, is the famous geochemist who was one of the first people to measure oxygen isotopes in meteorites. And so he's, he's a, a big star in the field. They published what I think is still, you know, what is still the accepted explanation for what controls the oxygen isotope composition of seawater. It's mostly controlled by cycling of water through the mid-ocean ridge hydrothermal vents. And the way this works is that the uh, seawater, if we, if we work on a SMO scale, standard, standard mean ocean water, seawater is at zero per mil. Basalts are at about 5.7 per mil. And uh, this is, these are data from a and a Muhlenbach Science 93 paper. They're looking at an o ophiolite, which is a preserved section of oceanic crust going down uh, from zero to five kilometers. This is, uh, they argue, is they're, they're looking at the, uh, the effects of one of these hydrothermal weathering systems, hydrothermal circulation systems. At high temperatures deep within the vents, the seawater is trying to come to the same isotopic composition of the rock. So the, the seawater is getting heavier because it's extracting O18 from the rock. Uh, at low temperatures in the upper parts there, then you're, you're depositing, uh, exchanging uh, oxygen isotopes with the rock and the O18 goes back into the basalts. So the upper, the upper portions of the ophiolite are enriched in O18 and the lower portions of the ophiolite are depleted in O18. And it's this, this is more important. There's also exchange that occurs during continental weathering, but the water fluxes through the mid-ocean ridges are so large that that's what dominates the, uh, the budget. Now, and, and then these same authors then have argued that this process has been going on Plate tectonics has been going on throughout the Earth's history. Therefore, seawater isotopic composition doesn't change with time. That's the argument. But uh, that's only true if the vent systems operated the same way in the past as they do today. And so you have to ask whether or not that's the case. Well, as I mentioned at the outset, we've been working on this and wrote a paper in EPSL a couple of years ago giving one suggested reason for why things might change. Maybe plate tectonics hasn't always been operating the same as today. One thing that we, another point that we all agree with, I think this one, there's no dissenters, uh, geothermal heat flow was higher in the past because there, was more, there were more radioactive elements in the crust and mantle giving off more heat. There's also more uh, energy left over from accretion. So there's more uh, geothermal heat coming out. Then you get, what, how does that affect plate tectonics? Here the models are all over the place. Uh, I'm going to quote a model here by Eldridge Moores, but Norm Sleep has a model, plate tectonics model, that predicts the same thing. Both of these models say that the oceanic crust would have been thicker in the past because the heat is getting, you would get a greater depth of partial melting at the ridges and uh, because of the increased heat flow. So in, in Eldridge Moores' model, the oceanic crust today is about seven or eight kilometers thick, but as you go back into the Archean, the, the crust could have been 20 to 25 kilometers thick. And then uh, plate tectonics itself might operate very differently. In particular, this thick oceanic crust is still lighter than the underlying mantle, and so it should float isostatically, and it should displace seawater. And that would mean that the mid-ocean ridges would be less deeply submerged than they are today. Well, why does that matter? It turns out, uh, and this is something that John Barras, I think, has worked out on here out at University of Washington, in many of the uh, mid-ocean ridge vent systems, the water 
going through those vents is in what we call the super convective regime. You may know that the water coming out of a typical black smoker, at least on a uh, fast spreading ridge, is coming out right near the critical point for seawater. Uh, and so that means that below that, you're in the supercritical regime where the heat transport properties of water are very, uh, very high. This is a graph that I actually made a long time ago that graphs a uh, combination of seawater parameters that go into heat transport. Alpha is the coefficient of thermal expansion, rho is density, CP is the uh, specific heat at constant pressure of water, and nu is the kinematic viscosity. If you combine these things and make a contour map, you see that uh, going pressure in bars from 0 to 600 and temperature from 0 to 600, you see that uh, things peak. Here's the critical point. This is done for pure water. The critical point is at 220 bars and 370, uh, 374 Celsius, so right here. And so the, uh, the, the vents, if you just follow an adiabat down there, it's going right through this supercritical regime. This is something, if you look at the literature on this, there's a whole big literature uh, that goes back 20 or 30 years. People, oceanographers pointing out that the, that's very special properties. And what we did is just a simple 1D uh, analysis that says, suppose you reduce the, uh, the depth above the mid-ocean ridges, then you can't get into that supercritical regime. Water won't be as effective at transporting out the heat and therefore, the hydrothermal penetration depth actually would have to be much shallower. Um, so for instance, if you go down along an adiabat within the vents here and graph this water properties parameter, it peaks at the critical point and then goes back down. And this was what our 1D model predicts on hydrothermal penetration depth, that uh, when, when you have a shallowly submerged ridges, the penetration would be not nearly as deep and so you wouldn't have that high temperature interaction zone between the seawater and the basalts. And that will then change the balance that is uh, controlling the isotopic composition of seawater. I'm going through this too fast to, to do it in detail. But the, the, the basic point here is that you can think of plausible changes that will, that will change, the, you know, even though you've got the same mechanism controlling seawater isotopic composition, if you change the boundary conditions on it, then you can get very different results. There's a couple other things. If you've got shallower water, it'll boil in the vent systems, and the brine is enriched in O18, and that will be interacting with the rock, whereas the isotopically light, lighter vapor escapes. So, so you, the, you know, we argued in this paper then that you can still reproduce the, the, what you see in the ophiolites. It doesn't necessarily mean that seawater isotopic composition has been the same. Finally, the uh, last point, you also have to be able to explain the silicon isotope data. But remember, the silicon isotope data in the Robert and Chaussidon paper are determined, that fractionation is determined by the difference between the temperatures within the vent systems and the temperature of seawater. In their model, they assume that the vent systems were the same temperature as today and seawater was much warmer, thereby reducing the temperature difference. In our model, we assume that seawater was the same temperature as today, but the vent systems were much cooler, and that reduced, it goes the same direction. So arguably, this same mechanism could explain the silicon isotope data. All right. So that, let me leave you then. Uh, that's a lot of stuff in a short period of time, but I'll leave you then with some speculative conclusions, uh, I think it's unlikely, in, in spite of all that isotopic and biological data, I think it's unlikely that that model is correct. We think the early Earth was uh, more temperate, more like today, uh, partially because the sun was less cold. The biological data, you know, rather than representing the temperature of the entire Earth, maybe that just means that organisms migrated from predominantly hot springs environments to a more general, cooler environment. Uh, our, these large multi-ball bar oscillations in CO2 are hard to explain. The paleoproterozoic glaciations are nicely explained by the rise of oxygen and the loss of methane. And then finally, there's still a lot of disagreement on this. So my main purpose in giving this talk is just to raise these issues and see if any of you have ideas on how to contribute to this debate. Thank you. Thank you.
Roger. Is there any way of independently measuring um, the temperature of Archean hydrothermal systems that doesn't rely on oxygen isotopes? Because if your argument's correct, um, maybe you can use volcanogenic massive sulfide deposits or I don't know, what, uh, uh, the, the supposed uh, uh, ophiolite that's recently been discovered at Isua to measure both penetration depth and temperature of the water in the park. Right, that's a, that's a very good question. I mean, and this is something that I looked into carefully because I was worried when we were writing this paper that just such data might exist somewhere. That you know, if you have a mineral assemblage, suppose you find an ophiolite and you see some mineral assemblage out there that you know for sure what temperature it came out at, uh, then you can test uh, the model. And as far as I'm aware, this has not been done. I mean, I've, I've I'm not really in this field, but I've searched as well as I can. And I had a big email correspondence with Carlos Muhlenbox and Paul Knauf last fall and Bob Gregory. And, you know, I don't think, you know, I, I've not been shown any data from the ophiolites or anywhere else that really constrain, constrain that t uh, interaction temperature. So I think they've been over-interpreting their data. They're simply assuming the same interaction temperature, and, and that's, you know, that really then fixes the result. But, but it's not a safe assumption. What was the early temperature if it wasn't 75? What, what would you guess the temperature was? Well, I was just chatting with Roger about this. There, there is a published estimate. You can use uh, the pre gypsum apparently evaporated, well, precipitated back in the Archean. And this is something that Roger published many years ago. Uh, Roger, you're, you're looking at barite, right? But uh, with, or, that was... It started out like this gypsum. It started off life as gypsum, and the published, uh, that gives an upper limit on temperature. The published upper limit was 60 degrees, but you and David Catling have looked at this more recently, and it depends on salinity, and, and so actually, I mean, what would you say, Roger? What, what's the, uh, what is the gypsum? 20. All right. So this is, I had actually forgotten that before I came out here and I was chatting with Roger earlier. If you believe that gypsum argument, then that may be able to constrain, if, you know, if the temperature is below 20, it can't be much below 20 or you go glacial. We're at 15 today, 15 degrees C global average today, and it's a glacial climate. So that would say the temperatures would have been uh, like today or maybe just a little bit warmer. You mentioned the, the carbon and silicon cycle. That's sort of enshrined in textbooks today. I've even taught it myself. But I guess I don't understand how, if you believe that the carbon and silicon cycle is happening, why would you have three bars of CO2 in such a warm temperature? Wouldn't that, by invoking the carbon and silicon cycle, draw down CO2 to more climate levels? I mean, well, the, in that picture that I showed you, the silicate weathering is happening on the continents. So suppose the continents were much smaller early on. Jim Walker published a model like this back in 19, mid 1980s. So he said, consider an ocean-covered Earth. Where does and he said, let's let's say that the amount of carbon at Earth's surface is the same as today, about 60 or 80 bars of CO2. Uh, in that case, it can only be removed by weathering of the seafloor. Uh, and so Jim did a little back of the end. He thought that process was very inefficient, and he concluded that you'd get 10 bars of CO2 in the atmosphere in steady state. Now, since that time, Kevin Zonley and Norm Sleep have written a paper in uh, JGR. They add something to it. They think, you know, they argue pretty convincingly that carbon is being exchanged between the crust and the mantle. And so in their model, the CO2 forms carbonate veins in the ocean, and those carbonate veins are subducted into the mantle. So they think that all the CO, most of the CO2 was originally in Earth's, Earth's mantle, and they argue that the early Earth was cold. So, so you know, my take home view of that is that from a theoretical standpoint, you can get almost any answer you want, depending on the assumptions that you make. I don't think any of the arguments are particularly strong. The, the problem with, th with theirs, actually, is that they, they, they say that you, know, you would be uh, very cold. In fact, you'd be snowball Earth. That cuts off the atmosphere from the ocean, so there's no way to get the ocean. If you have subaerial volcanoes, there's no way to get the CO2 down to the seafloor. So you have to do a, a coupled problem to get an answer on this.
Chris Carlson. How open are necessary assumptions about tur turbospheric and stratospheric cloud traps that you get for your CO2 methane? Right, so what we do for, for water clouds is we, 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 we don't exactly neglect them, we put them at the surface because we're, uh, clouds are a very important part of the climate. And in fact, there's a, a literature out there, if you go look, people suggesting that you can solve the faint young sun problem by just having lower cloudiness on the early Earth. You know, the sun was 30% less bright early in the Earth's history. Earth's albedo is about 30% and most of that is clouds. So then if you have no clouds on the early Earth, that exactly compensates for the faint young sun. But then you get to this question, you know, if temperatures were warm and if the, most of the Earth's surface was covered by water, how could there not be clouds? Uh, you know, I just don't think that that's a self-consistent answer. If you want to do better than this, then, uh, you know, so we put the cloud layer at the ground, we tune the climate model so that we get the right answer for present Earth, we tune the surface albedo, which, which simulates a cloud layer, and then we just hold that fixed as we go back in time essentially assuming zero cloud feedback. And so it depends what you think the early, if the early Earth was cold, then cloudiness might have been less, but if it was warmer than today, I don't see how that could be the case. I'm trying to imagine the biology side, you only have the one liner there. So is the idea that the life was huddling around the warm places uh, and then only was forced to adapt uh, when things got cooler? Well, you know, I went over the biology part pretty quickly because I don't know how to explain that. There's been the, you know, it, the, the argument about hyperthermals in the R, RNA tree has been around for a long time and there's been a whole literature of people trying to, ex one explanation for that is that it's, uh, the, the survive, you, you had life originated at, at cooler temperatures but then you had a giant impact and uh, raised temperatures and only the thermo hyperthermophilic uh, organisms lived through the giant impact, right? But this latest one with the, the, the Gauche thing with the biological, you know, the resurrected proteins and the molecular clock dating, I'm not the best person to address that, although I know there are a lot of people who don't like molecular clocks. And so you can go after that. Uh, I, I, my colleague, at, you know, Blair Hedges at Penn State is one of the people that does these things. And, you know, so you can go after that part of the argument. I kind of like the resurrected protein thing. It was really clever, and I, you know, could hardly believe when I read the details that, you know, how they're actually doing that, recreating the proteins and measuring their melting point temperatures. So uh, I don't know. I mean, maybe. Does anybody here want to explain that for us? <laughs> Well, no, that's, that's actually, I didn't give that part, but it, when oxygen is low, then that's exactly what we do with our photochemical model. If you put in the same flux of methane that you have today, you get the, the lifetime of methane is about a thousand times longer. So you get, instead of one part per million, you get a thousand parts per million. And then I had a PhD student a few years ago, Pushkar Karecha, who did some simple ecological models of the, the Archean and anaerobic Archean Ocean. We think that methanogens would be living throughout the water column and in sediments. And we, we constructed a little model and were able to show to my satisfaction that the fluxes of methane coming out of that would be sort of within a factor of three of the present uh, value. So no, I mean, one of the reasons we believe in the methane greenhouse is not because we need the methane, it's, it's just hard to avoid the methane. Okay. The only way to avoid it is if methanogens evolved very late in evolutionary history, which there are some supporters of that view, but they're not in the majority. Oh, what would a 75 uh, C uh, Earth be like in terms of albedo you know, and greenhouse effect through the water vapor in the atmosphere? Rain, how much rain was falling in Seattle? <laughs> the, the amount of rainfall is actually very, enormous. very close. No, it's not enormous. And this was, it's about the same as today. And this is something that I didn't realize. Dick Holland educated me on this uh, some time ago. The, the amount of rainfall is limited by the amount of sunlight that hits the ocean surface. So, you know, today about half the energy of the sunlight that hits the surface goes into uh, evaporation of seawater. 
And thus, you know, there's no way you can increase the amount of evaporation by more than a factor of two compared to today, regardless of how hot it is. Now you can ask, how do you, how do you resolve that? Well, the evaporation rate is a function of three things. One is temperature, the uh, relative humidity, and wind speed. And so let's forget about the wind speed because that's hard to know. But what happens if you had a three bar atmosphere or a 10 bar CO2 atmosphere, the temperature would be very high, but the evaporation rate is constrained by energy balance and therefore the relative humidity would rise to the point where evaporation was cut down to about its present rate. I think that argument is right. Uh, so, so is Arizona not used to it? Yeah, it's, it's surprisingly, well, it's, no, it's not Arizona, it's humid, right? But it's not raining that, that much in terms of uh, volume because there just is enough energy to drive a fast hydrologic cycle. Any questions? Any questions? Okay. All right, then, well, let's thank uh, Jim again.